Amen and amen. And let's give him a big round of applause for what he's doing here at our church, for what he's doing here in people's lives, the impact that he's making on people's lives and the people in our community is unreal. It's great. If I've ever done a, a series of messages that have, let me just say, that have kicked my hind in, that have stirred me up, that have impacted my life, that struck home, hit a nerve, it's this series that we've been on for the last three weeks. And it's one that we're going to conclude today. And we've called this series Baggage. And we've learned through this series that all of us in here have some certain type of baggage. I don't care if you've grown up in what we would call the, the perfect environment, the perfect childhood, the perfect whatever. I guarantee you, you have some kind of baggage. What kind of baggage do people carry? What kind of baggage do people struggle with? Maybe it's the baggage in, in our relationships. Maybe it's the baggage of a, of, a, of a failed marriage. Maybe it's the baggage of something between you and somebody's just not right. Whatever it is, we all have baggage. And hopefully through this series, we'll learn how to push away that baggage. We won't ever have to pull up those three pieces of baggage anymore. So over the last three weeks, we've, we've dealt with the, the baggage of a bitter spirit. We've learned that a bitter spirit will destroy you. It will eat you alive. It will destroy your relationships. It will destroy your marriages. It will restore, destroy your friendships unless we learn how to forgive as Jesus forgave. We also learned in that message that only forgiven people forgive. Jesus died on the cross. He rose again so that we could forgive people. He forgave us of our sin. We forgive people who've trespassed against us. Then last week we, we learned about the baggage of a judgmental spirit. And man, that was a pretty tough pill to swallow. We learned that before we can take the splinter out of our brother's eye, we have to worry about the log that's in our eye. We also learned that the log that's in our eye causes a splinter in another person's eye. They don't get the splinter from anywhere else but the log that's in our eye. So we've learned how to deal with that. We learned that we're not to, to go out and, and, and judge the lost world we learned that the Bible says it's okay for us to judge, but we reserve that judgment for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We reserve that judgment for the church. Going out and judging lost people doesn't do a bit of good. This week, hang on. It's the baggage that I think is more prevalent in the church that weighs the church down, that, that hinders or, or, or causes a pastor more heartache and more grief than any other baggage. This is the baggage of unresolved conflict. So I want you to go ahead and get your Bibles out. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter number 18. So today we're dealing with the baggage, the beat up, dirty, nasty, that I'm scared to open, nasty, dirty baggage of unresolved conflict. It's the dirtiest of them all. We're going to talk about two words today. And in our vocabulary, I believe today that they, they, they are... They carry a, a very negative connotation. The first is conflict. We look at, uh, we look at conflict as, as something negative. The second one is confrontation. Now I know, maybe with a few exceptions, that none of us in here like confrontation, right? 
None of us in here really like conflict. How many, how many times have you heard someone say, I, I, I just don't want to have any confrontation with nobody. You know, I want to be sail, sail down easy street. I don't want to have any conflicts with anybody. I just like sailing down an easy road. And, and I want to make a confession to you this morning. There's approximately 20 Saturdays and Sundays a year that I love conflict. Don't steal my line. <laughs> One of them on Sunday is a football game. We see them on Saturdays in college basketball. We see them on Sundays now too as a NASCAR race. When they get on the field, they have conflict. They play to win. It's good. I like to see it. I like to see it on the racetrack. A little beating and a banging and a rubbing. We've seen a little bit of that this week. But there's a reason I like conflict. And it's, and it's for this. I'm not in it. I get to watch it. And most of the times, my side wins. You can see me after the service to find out who my teams are. But if you want to be on the winning side... No. In truth, we're going to deal with today that those two words not necessarily have to be negative words. In America, they're negative. But if we look at them in a, in a, in a biblical sense, the way Jesus taught them, then we'll learn that conflict and confrontation doesn't have to be negative. One reason why it does have to be negative uh, is negative because conflict caused a world war that killed over 50 million people. That's not the kind of conflict we want to we want to learn about. But we're going to learn something amazing today from the teachings of Jesus, not of Chris. We're going to see what Jesus taught us today, and that neither conflict or confrontation is negative. Many times in Scripture we learn that God always uh, He always he always hits a great lick, even if it's a crooked stick. Y'all know what that means? God always hits a great lick, even if it's a crooked stick. It means sometimes he does use conflict. Sometimes he does use confrontation. But what's it for? It's for restoration. That's what we're going to look at. We're going to learn today that God uses conflict, confrontation as a, for an opportunity for us to demonstrate the love of Christ. To demonstrate and for us to carry out the gospel so that those people on the outside who are uh, lost, who are unbelievers, they can see our example of how Christ would handle conflicts in our life. I've seen a conflict on Facebook this week. I'm not going to say any names, but it was a conflict. And it didn't look very good for Team Jesus. The lost and dying world seen it. Maybe the person maybe was right, but they handled it in the wrong way. It didn't shed a good light on our Christian witness. It didn't bear a good witness for our Team Christ and one of the most, did you know that one of the most loving, positive things that we could do to someone else was, would be to help them when we see that they're in the wrong? It's one of the most loving things you can do. If you see a brother or a sister who's going down the wrong road, we have a responsibility. It's our responsibility to, to, to tell them, hey, brother. Hey, sister. Hey, friend. Hey, believer. And help them get back on that right road. Even when we know that it may cause some hurt feelings. Even when we know that it could be tough. And I guarantee you, if you live long enough, you're going to have to deal with one of these situations. I promise you after you hear, y'all better listen because after today, you're going to have to deal with some unresolved conflict in your life. I guarantee you it's coming. 
But guess what? Pull up your chair. Lean back if you need to. Get you a big old drink of water. Because this it's going to be good. It's going to be good. When it comes to negative conflict and unresolved confrontation, we have to be willing to do what Jesus said. One of the, I don't know why this is coming to my mind, one of the, one of the saddest phone calls that I've ever received in my life is, is a friend of mine whose father had just died. And he called me and he was upset as, as to be expected. And it was just awful because what I learned was there was some conflict, unresolved conflict, between my friend and his father. His father died with unresolved conflict. He was so tore up and so distraught about the unresolved conflict conflict that was in that relationship even though the father was in the wrong even though he was in the wrong my friend never went up and tried to resolve the conflict that was in that situation and I can guarantee you that he, 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 was, he, was, he was so hurt because that's all he could think about was that unresolved conflict and how he should have went, even though he was the right person, how he should have went and spoke to his father about that unresolved conflict. I want to ask you a question this morning. It's not a, it's not a fun question, but... Is there anyone you know in your life, Holy Spirit, reveal it to you? Is there anyone you know in your life today that if they were to die, you would have regrets about that unresolved conflict? Is there anyone that you can think of that has committed such a, 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 a terrible sin against you that you wake up in the morning and it just boils your blood? Is there anybody that you can bring to your mind that you pray for at night, not good prayers. When you go to bed, you think about how they've sinned you. When you wake up in the morning, you think about who sinned you, and you tell everybody there is how they done you wrong and how, how they treated you in such a, a, a bad, negative, ungodly, unruly manner. If you can think of a person in your life this morning, if you... If that resonates you, resonates to you in your mind this morning, if the Holy Spirit revealed somebody, somebody in your life this morning, then you're going to have to listen to this next statement. And the key takeaway, rest if you'll put up that first slide, there are no problems too big to solve, just people too little to solve them. That hits home with me. Because there has been some unresolved conflict in my life in the future or in, in the past. And it's easier to deal with it then than it is years later. It's a whole lot easier. So we're going to study today what we call or could call Conflict Resolution 101. It's a very simple message. And if we would get this message, this simple message that Jesus taught... If we would get this, it would defrost cold marriages. It would bring to life stale relationships that you may have. And if we would apply that, you would be surprised at how quick that would happen. It's a simple teaching that Jesus teaches us this morning. So let me ask you this. Has someone offended you? Has someone ever hurt you? Has someone ever sinned against you? Here's the big question. How do we deal with it? How do we deal with it? The first thing we have to do is we have to personally admit that there's an issue. We have to admit it that there's an issue between you and another person. So 
Look at Matthew chapter number 18, verse number 15. Jesus teaches here. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Let's look at that again. If a brother sins against you, what's it say next? Go. Everybody say go. go. Now, take that word go and circle it in your Bible. Highlight it on your pad or your phone. It's very important there. He says, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained a brother. So here's the situation. Jesus is describing a, an issue, an unresolved conflict that needs to be resolved. This problem has elevated to a, 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 a conflict that he sees necessary to confront and resolve. This is not talking to the lost unbelievers that we may know on our jobs or that we may know at the supermarket, those ones we know in the hospital or our doctor's office, out in the world. This, it's not talking about them. What's the word that he uses? He uses brother. Now, I'm not talking about blood kin. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about us in the church. He's talking about any believer, any follower of Christ, any Christian. This is who it's directed to. It's directed to us as believers in Christ. What do you do? What do you do? And i, I got to put a disclaimer in here. Before we get into the details of this, this is with the assumption that this unresolved conflict is even worth dealing with. I know there might be some ladies in here uh, or ladies outside the world, and there's no ladies in here that do this. You may get offended if somebody says something about your new shoes. I know you paid a lot of money up for them. That might have just hurt your feelings. But that's a conflict you need to let go. You know, that's not worth going and stirring something up. There's some of us guys in here that talk about the truck we drive or the boat we got or the fishing rods we might have or the clothes we might wear or something that was said that embarrassed you or those are conflicts. They are some conflicts that are not worth getting into a conflict over. Do y'all hear me? Everybody say amen then. That's how I know if you're hitting me. I'm going to keep saying it until you say amen me. So y'all amen me. We, we got to learn how to discern if it's, an over, if it's an offense that's worth causing conflict or confrontation or it's something we can just look over. There, there's two categories, one that's worth dealing with and one that's not worth dealing with. Ones that are not worth dealing with, we got to do that, what's that song? Man, I done forgot it. Let it go. Who sings that? Elsa? You got to let it go. Let it go. Thank you. Thank you. Because truthfully, David, I want you to amen me real loud on this. Amen, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> truthfully if we made a big deal Wendy I want you to amen me too because this, this ain't just your this is all of you. if we made a big deal about every time our spouse <laughs> said something to offend us We'd be in conflict 24-7. Now, I know some of you are sitting here and you're going like, man, that's, that's my life, dude. <laughs> hey, you got to learn how to move past some of that stuff. Every mountain is not worth dying on. Amen. Let it go. Some things are not worth fighting over. Some things are worth talking over, but maybe not a fight. Sometimes the biggest and the best thing for you to do is move on. Let it go. It's not that big of a deal. Forget it. But you got to be careful. 
you got to be very careful because sometimes overlooking an offense is wrong. Sometimes brushing that conflict and that confrontation is wrong. When God says it's wrong, guess what? It's wrong. There's some offenses that can't be overlooked. There are some offenses that shouldn't be overlooked. In fact, a person needs to be confronted if they hurt you in a serious, a deep hurt kind of thing. If you know that it will continue if you do not confront them, then they need to be confronted. Because you don't want somebody to keep on going hurt others, right? You don't want to, you won't want to carry that. So here's the point. Jesus is dealing with this situation where the offense is so great that it needs to be dealt with. Okay? Uh, let me tell you that in the average situation, in most of our lives here, we don't do that. Here's how we handle it. First of all, we, we refuse to deal with it. Like I said, we say, well, uh, I don't like conflict. I don't want to confront this person. I just, I just don't want to deal with it. I don't need all this on me. And we push it to the side because we don't like confrontation, because we have such a strong distaste for conflict in our lives. We let people get by with offending us, hurting us, and hurting other people. Let me tell you, that is wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. There's a right way to do it. There's a right way to go to someone and present the conflict. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Even though... Let me tell you, if you don't deal with that problem, the problem is going to deal with you. That problem that you have, that unresolved conflict that you have with your brother is going to fester, and it's going to fester, and it's going to fester, and then it turns into what we talked about in the first uh, message of this series, it turns into bitterness. Maybe I should have preached this one first. Unresolved conflict turns into bitterness. It will eat you alive then eventually, guess what we do? We go and say, we go tell somebody else. I found that it's about impossible for us not to tell somebody else. When somebody offends us, when we have an unresolved conflict, we go whisper in somebody else's ear. We've just brought a person who didn't have anything to do with the problem. Now they're in the problem. You slobbered all over them. You've brought a person who has nothing to do with it, and now it's his problem too. That's how most of us deal with it. The first thing we've got to do is admit there's an issue. We have to admit there's a... Quit pretending that you're not upset. Quit pretending that you're not bitter. Quit pretending that you're not on edge. Quit pretending that you have to act like one way when you feel another way in front of this person that you have unresolved conflict with. Quit carrying around those grudges that you have with people that you have unresolved conflict with. Admit there's a problem and deal with it. Number two is we have to properly assess the situation. Jesus uses a word here uh, in, this, in this text that we know that not only confrontation is necessary, but it's the most loving and the most godly thing to do when we have a conflict with somebody. And that's uh, the word brother. Remember what I said? He's not talking about a stranger. He's talking about us in here. He's talking about fellow believers in Christ. He's saying this, you ought to be the people who can resolve your conflict because I'm your Lord and Savior. And you ought to set the example 
for the people who are outside, for the unbelievers, for the strangers. We got to be the example. What I say in one of those things, we're not just representing ourselves here. We're representing the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the God of all creation. We've got to show this in front of the world. You know why most people don't come to church? This is free. It's because Christians. We are the very reason people don't like coming into a church. We dealt with that last week because people outside the church, especially the younger generation, they don't want to come here and be judged. So, so here he's talking about a brother. He's talking about someone who is a part of our family. He's talking about someone that we, that we do life with every day, a, a fellow follower of Christ, a fellow Christian. Y'all get that? Amen me. If there's anybody in the world that should work out our conflict, it's us. Now, here's what I want to do. we got to go back because we want this scripture in context. I don't like taking scripture out of context. we got to put it in context. So go back to verse uh, number 12. Look at verse number 12. You see, Jesus, before he talked about a family, brothers, he talked about a flock. He talked about, before he talked about siblings, he talked about some sheep. This is one of Jimmy's favorite verses. Verse number 12. Here's what Jesus says. What do you think? Let me give you another little hint here. If Jesus ever comes up and asks you one of these questions, don't answer it. Because he's going to show you why you're wrong. But this is Jesus here, and he's asking his disciples, what do you think? What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them has gone astray... Does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? He gives the example here of a man who has a hundred sheep on this mountain. One of them goes astray. One of them goes missing. And the guy leaves the 99 and goes and looks for the one. That seems a little strange to me. You see, when we, when we lose something, we always focus on what we lose and not what we have. On the surface, it seems just a little strange to us. But we do the exact same things, and let me prove it to you. What happens, got the keys on. What happens when you lose your keys? Oh, my God. Oh, where's my keys? You see my keys? Where's my keys? I can't do nothing else. Where's my keys? You see my car keys? Amy, where'd you hide my car keys? Where they at? I cannot find my keys. I'm, you don't focus on anything else to get till you find those keys, right? You're not focused on, hey, I lost my keys, but I got a car outside. Hey, I lost my keys, but I got a nice house. What about if you go to Walmart? If you got three children, you're in, you're, in the, you're in Walmart shopping around, you got these three kids, they're following you around, you, you're looking for stuff, and pick, picking up stuff, putting them in a basket, and you look around and one of your kids is gone. You don't say, well, I got two more. <laughs> I'm not going to worry about them two more because I, I, I'm not going to worry about that fellow who went gone. I got two more kids. What do you do? You go get on the loudspeaker, you go find a, a, a sales attendant, you go tell every customer in the store, and you start looking for that lost child. It's starting to make a little sense to you now. You don't forget about the one who's lost. You don't forget about the one who wandered off. Jesus goes, to say and goes on to say in verse 13, he says, And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than he does the 99 that never went astray. The reason why there's so much joy when you find that lost sheep is not because that, that sheep is more valuable than the other sheep. He didn't love the one that went astray more than he loved the other sheep. But he seen that they were lost. 
and that they needed to be rescued. That's what he wants us to see. They need to be rescued. When someone offends you, goes astray, we go talk to them. We go confront them because we love our brother who maybe will be who maybe is going down that wrong path, who may is may is, uh, cause be causing a lot of destruction in somebody's life. When somebody's sinned against you or somebody's done something wrong to hurt you, what do you do? You go talk to them about it. You go confront them. You go to that person who's wandered off that path and you lovingly confront them. You lovingly try to help them and let them know, hey, mm, might be veering off of here a little bit. You've took your eyes off the target and you're veering. You've took your eyes off the prayer and you're just 10 degrees off. You're just one degree off. Let me help you. Let's, let's work this situation out. That's why, I, that's why I want to say this again. Confrontation and conflict doesn't have to be negative. Confrontation is the most loving and the most godly thing you can do for a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ. And as we're going to see in a moment, confrontation is not retribution. Confrontation is for the rescue. Finding the one who was lost. When you go into these situations, you're never looking for revenge. You're, you're trying to restore a relationship, which leads to uh, point number three. Privately approach the person or persons involved. Let's look again at verse number 15, Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, everybody say, go. And tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained a brother. What's the first thing that we're to do if somebody offends you? Go. That's the first thing Jesus tells us to do. He don't say, go home and think about it a while. He don't say, well, go think about what you're going to say. He doesn't say, Wait till the situation calms down a couple weeks and then go. The first thing he tells us to do, just like the first thing he told us to do when he ascended to heaven, is go and make disciples. In this situation, when a brother offends us, we're to go to that person. Here's, here's the problem and the way the unresolved conflict starts. Here's why the problem continues to fester. Is because we make excuses. It's never right to make an excuse. Well, he ain't going to listen to me. I, 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 I've told him about this before and he ain't going to learn. Still not an excuse. Well, I just don't want to make him angrier. I don't want to get him mad so he'll yell at me. Go to the person. Those are not excuses. Here's the next step, and it's a crucial one. He says to tell him his fault between you and him alone. There's a great, great principle here. And we... we so repeatedly violate this principle in the church today. It's to, it, it, we violate it in our, not only the church, we do it in our marriages. We do it in our, our friendship, in our homes, in our families, and in our workplaces where there are other Christians that are be there. Here's the principle. Whenever conflict occurs, you keep your circle, the people who know about it, as small as possible. You keep it small as possible for as long as possible. Because this tells us that your major reason for the conflict is not for your pound of flesh or for revenge. It's because you're going to that person. You and the person and the problem. 
You're going straight to that person. You're not looking for revenge. Um, you let other people know. Looking, the other people that are looking at us, the other people who are outside watching us, you let them know how bad this person has treated you, how bad they've wronged you, when we don't go to them one-on-one -on -one and in a personal way. It just looks bad on you. When you privately go to someone, it's obvious that you're not just trying to win an argument. You see, a lot of us think we have to win the argument. It's not, it's not biblical, it's not godly, and it's not the loving thing to do. We're not going to our brother with a conflict to try to win the argument. The point of the conflict is restitution, um, to restore, restoration, to restore that relationship. And then Jesus says this. He says, if he listens to you, what? You've gained your brother. You don't go hoping that he won't listen. You go hoping and believing that he's going to listen. That they're going to listen to you. And if they do, you've gained your brother. The word gained here in the Greek is well, I forgot what the word in Greek is, but here's what it means. It means it's a financial term. It means to make money or to to uh, 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 win a prize. If you go to your brother and if he listens to you, you win. You win his love. You've gained a brother. And I want you to listen to this. This is extremely important. When you choose to handle a conflict with somebody in the right way. It's always a win-win situation. You'll never have a win-lose situation. That's never impossible because if you go to this person and he listens to you, that's a win for you. And if he listens to you and you gain the brother and he, he applies that to his life, he's one too. But if you never go to the person, if you never have that conflict or that confrontation, it's always lose-lose. There's never a win-lose. It's a win-win or a lose-lose. Even if he don't listen, it's still a win-win, a win for you because you've done what you're supposed to do. It's a win for everybody because he's heard you. Just as that shepherd rejoices over one sheep, that's what we're to do. We're to go after that wayward brother that wayward sister and have the conflict. What if I don't listen? What if they refuse to hear me? What do we do? And here's the last step, point number four. Persistently apply the effort to reconcile. So suppose this person doesn't listen. He refuses to admit his wrongdoings. He refuses to repent. Here's, the, here's what we do. The second thing we're to do, look at verse number 16. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now go back to the, the child at, in the Walmart analogy. When we know that child is missing, we don't just run around the store looking for him ourselves. We bring everybody else in. We bring others in to that so we can find that lost person. That's what Jesus tells us to do. Just as God doesn't give up on us, we're not to give up on our brothers. There's another reason we do take a two or three with us to do it. It's because you have a witness. When that brother or sister or whoever it may be, follower of Christ, when they refuse to listen to you, when they refuse to admit their wrongdoing, when they refuse to repent for what they've done, you've got witnesses. You've got other people that say, hey, this brother did everything that was required of him. He done everything that Jesus taught him to do, and you have a witness and a record of the brother or the person, his unrepentance. 
if he refuses to listen to them, verse number 17, what's it say? Tell it to the church. Now, you really have to look at this, and you really have to study this. It says, and if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax, tax collector. Now, we've got to keep in mind, Jesus said this before there was a church. He said these things before the church was ever formed. So what he is referring here to is not only church, but people of authority. His other friends or people in your group, whoever the authority is, that's who he's referring to. We go to them. The church wasn't even formed yet. So you don't have to drag them up here on stage and say, you don't have to do that. I mean, there may be times necessary when we ought to do that. But I think more Jesus is saying here is you ought to bring him before all of his friends or all the people that are both of you guys as friends or the circle of influence in that person's life. Why do you do that? Same thing. We do it so we can have a record. We also do it to give the brother another chance to repent, another chance for the brother to reconcile his differences, to admit his wrong do, di, wrongdoings. But what's it say if he, he still refuses to repent? Come on now. The Bible says at this point, after you've went to him personally, after you've took two or three people, after you've brought them in front of their circle of influence or church, they still refuse to listen to you. We treat them like outsiders. We refuse to associate with them. We, we choose not to have any social activity with them in our lives or in the church or in their circle of influence until they become repentant. Now, does that mean we treat them ugly? No. We're still to love them. We're still to pray for them. We're still to lift them up in, 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 in prayers. and We, we don't have, have to still treat them with a mean spirit. We just don't talk to them anymore. We don't put them in leadership position. We don't let them sour other people up. We disassociate ourselves with them. We treat them as outcasts. We treat them as outsiders, as a last resort. But we still love them, pray for them. We don't kick them when they're down. Here's what 2 Thessalonians says about this situation. 2 Thessalonians... Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.15 puts it this way. Do not regard him after you've put him off. Don't regard him as the enemy. We're not to treat him like the enemy, but we're to warn him as a brother. We're to warn the person as a brother until they repent. We continue to pray. We continue to love. We let it made known in the, in the church and our circle of influences that this is what's going on. We've disassociated with this person. Still love and pray. We're not, they're not our enemy. So let's turn this whole thing around on us. What if you are the person that offended someone? What if you know there's an unreconciled difference between you and another person and you're the person who was offended? What do you do? You're the one who's caused the breach in the relationship. Same thing. We're to go to that person. Where to, if we know that we've offended our brother, then we're to go to that person and do whatever it takes to reconcile that situation. Let, now, let, let me give you here six steps of reconciliation. The first one is to address everyone involved that has been hurt or offended. The second one is avoid these words, if, but, and maybe. Never use those words in an apology. All you married people should know that. Number three, we have to admit specifically the wrong that has been done. 
Number four, we accept the consequences of our actions. Number five, we change our behavior. We don't keep messing up and doing the same things twice. And then the sixth step of reconciliation is always ask for forgiveness. We take it seriously. We take these steps. There's a lot of pastors that get up and they talk about the steps of reconciliation, but they never do it. It's poison to the church. The Revolution Church, the staff here at Revolution Church, we practice what we preach. And when necessary, when necessary, we take it before authorities or the church. Go ahead and stand.